The following was recorded in front of a live studio audience at the Studio 21 Podcast Cafe. This is the United Podcast Network. This is Voices in Validation, brought to you by IVT Network. IVT Network is your expert source for life science regulatory knowledge. Voices in Validation brings you the best in validation and compliance topics. We interview industry experts from pharma, biotech, med devices, and laboratories. Here is the host of Voices in Validation, Stacy. Thank you, and welcome back, all our listeners, to Voices in Validation. This episode is the second in a three-part series, so if you tuned in last week, uh, with uh, part one with Roberta Good. She's principal with Alltrack LLC and is here walking us through the steps of the 10 steps of how to get your medical device uh, to market. And last week we, um, we talked about planning essentially and risk management. The first four steps encompassing planning and funding activities um, in this second episode, we will dive into design and development. Um, we'll hear a lot about risk management plans, testing out bad design, poor process or bad manufacturing, as well as designing to control harm brought about by failures, user error, et cetera. So welcome back, Roberta. Thanks, Stacey. It's a pleasure to be here. Oh, my gosh. I am so thankful to have you come back and, and helping us with this um, very labor-intensive topic, but one that is so, so, so valuable for not only entrepreneurs, but also our medical device uh, manufacturers and R&D teams out there. So um, recapping, we already recapped what we talked about last week, but let's understand what we're going to talk about um, this week. If you can just mention the broad range of tasks that make up this design and development phase. Sure, Stacey. I'm happy to. So in the design and development phase, phase two, we're really looking at just four or five broad elements, conducting iterative product design, using design for Six Sigma, design for manufacturability and assembly. Um, We're looking at submitting patent and regulatory filings. We are evaluating and building our very essential risk management file. Uh, And then we're going to dive into performing our design verification and validation studies on both the product and the packaging. Um, In addition, we're looking at completing our process development. So aside from design verification and validation, we need to look at process validation. Uh, We're going to be developing and validating our manufacturing processes and our sterilization processes if indeed we're selling a sterile product. So once again, we have a lot to cover. Yeah, we do. <laughs> I appreciate you taking the time for this. Um, My pleasure. Th- of course. When introducing a new product, Roberta, it is typical to first develop a prototype. Um, is this also true in the medical device industry? And what's the best timing for prototype development? Yes, um, absolutely. It's the same in the medical device industry. And many long hours in the lab uh, with spare parts will attest to that. Uh, it typically, medical device engineers and product development will work with a, a surgeon or other healthcare provider um, to learn really what are the unmet needs in patient care. And then typically we'll go back to the lab and design several versions of prototypes for the physician to assess in the sure. clinical setting or even outside of the clinical setting, just um, in the hands of that individual to feel, to get the feel and the sizing and sort of the general rough idea of whether we are on the mark. And this is really best done early, early on in the process so that we can take that user feedback uh, and and use that to inform and optimize our design, including our materials of construction, our labeling claims, and more. So initial design evaluation includes prototype development, as we just spoke about. And human factors evaluation is also um, critical at this point. What is human factors engineering in medical devices and why is it often its own separate plan? Hmm. Great question, Stacey. Well, human factors engineering, it, it's, it aims to be able to anticipate and manage both the planned um, interactions and potential misuse as a user of a medical device interacts with that device, 
uh, and the unexpected um, interactions and to adapt to those unexpected interactions in such a way as to ensure patient safety. So it's kind of an interesting background. It, it actually grew out of a realization back in 1978 uh, at which the FDA was holding some hearings and um, they, they discovered that most patient deaths at that time clinically uh, were from anesthesia mistakes with general anesthesia administration. And of those, almost all of them were traced back to user error. Oh. So isn't that interesting? That is, yes, wow. And, and a little bit of trivia, Al Gore, Al Gore actually presided in these hearings. Isn't that fascinating? Oh my goodness. I know, it's just a little trivia for your interested listeners. So around about the year 2000, the FDA's CDRH, Center for Devices and Radiological Health, which right. oversees medical devices, released a human factors guidance, a uh, guidance document that requires use error or user error to be as a necessary consideration in our risk analysis process for product design. And this is a separate guidance, guidance document uh, that is available on FDA.gov for anyone who wants to, to, to look at that okay. further. Um, so nowadays, uh, what, we're, what we're required to do is to look at human factors and usability. That's just another term that means the same thing. Um, in pre-market submissions for new devices to FDA, it has to be there. Um, okay. Now, human factors engineering has to be addressed, um, not just not just in the pre-market submissions, but I mentioned the FDA guidance. Well, now there are international and national standards that cover it. I'll just, I know you'll put them in the show notes, but quickly, yeah. IEC 62366 and Amy HE75, for example, and there are others. And and finally, risk management plans now include user error and how to mitigate it. I, I mean, it seems so obvious, but I think mm -hmm. it is one of those things that we oftentimes forget to account for, right? You, we, we assume that everyone is going to use the product the way it is intended to, but, you know, life gets in the way. And there are, there are user errors in every industry. I mean, it's not just unique to medical devices, but user error always often comes into play. Mm -hmm. um, when there's some sort of mishap. Um, so it makes sense that they would require, um, these types of, um, provisions. So, um, another question for you, and we touched a little bit on this in episode one, but we know that design controls, um, and planning for those is really where the quality in our product comes from. Um, from the very beginning, we need to start planning and developing um, design controls and regulate certain types of records and documents to be generated during product development. And you touched upon this with the device history record. Um, that is a requirement in some regulatory uh, agencies. So, um, but I know there are other types of documentation and other things that not only FDA, but other regulatory branches are looking for. So can you explain what device history record is and how it differs from design history file and device master records? And huh. maybe come in on each of those <laughs> a little bit? Yes, yes. Oh, this is DBA, death by acronym. <laughs> so we've got we've got the DHF, the DMR, and the DHR. And forever, folks are confused, but I can try to simplify it a little. That would be much appreciated. Thank okay, you. sure thing. So let me start with the, the design history file, since that is the one that we referred to earlier, and I think it's maybe the most clear since we're in this development mindset right now. The design history file, it, it contains the records necessary to show that the way the product was conceived and developed was, in fact, in accordance with the approved design plan and the requirements of FDA's design controls. So that's 21 CFR 820, 
subpart C, design controls. Right. Uh, again, this is all part of the quality system regulation. Um, folks can look it up at FDA.gov. So the design history file in plain everyday language, it shows, it captures the evolution of the design. So, you know, the first iteration of the design might be on the back of a cocktail napkin at the old bar and grill, right? Right. But the second iteration maybe is typed and printed on heavy paper. And maybe the third iteration has a few uh, red pen markups that are initialed and dated uh, by the author and so on. And these will all be part of the design history file. However, informal they may be in some cases, that's not what's important. What's important is capturing that evolution. And it also, by the way, once we get to our final design, our design is frozen, as we like to say, then it will also include verification and validation reports, specifications, engineering drawings, and so on. So it's really so, a trail of a trail from beginning to end. Okay. Exactly. Of, of really what that R and D slash product development engineer has done in the process right. of developing a product. Now the device master record, I'll mention that one next. The device master record is created once we know for sure which product we're going to be designing. So it's not the first one, it's the second one. Okay. Okay. What a device master record is essentially, this is the easiest way I've found to, to remember it. It's a recipe for how to make more, okay. how to make more of this device. So it, it doesn't show any evolution. It's, it, starts from, it starts from the frozen device, the final device, when it goes into manufacturing. It's the recipe that gives manufacturing instructions, if you will. It's uh, how to make that particular type of medical device in that family of devices, not one specific lot number or batch number, but that family of products. So it's going to contain only the final specifications, not the entire iter iterative history of them. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's going to have manufacturing instructions, inspection requirements for quality, the bill of materials now that the materials of construction are finalized and so on. So that's the recipe, the device master record DMR. Okay, great. Okay, and the last one, and this one comes last <laughs> uh, in the series really and chronologically is the device history record. So confusing, isn't it? The way these terms are used. The device history record is a compilation of records or documents that contain the production history of a particular batch number or lot number of finished devices. So you'll have a new device history record or batch record created every time you build a, a distinct lot number or batch number of devices. So this is different. It's not just the recipe or instructions. It's what happened when you applied the recipe to this particular lot number. It's going to include signatures or initials and dates of the operators doing certain inspections. It's going to have a label taken off the final printed roll of labels affixed to the device history record so that you have a record of the labeling and so on. I hope that makes sense. No, it makes perfect sense. And so that um, that file that's unique to each lot number, if you will, I, man I imagine that provides some traceability, right? So if, if there's something that goes wrong with one batch of devices and it, you know, it, it poses a problem that wasn't there previously, they can go back and look at what was different or what happened um, differently than past, correct? Absolutely. Well said, Stacy. Excellent. Thank you so much for that clarification of those acronyms. Sometimes we tend to stumble over those things. <laughs> yes, we all do. <laughs> um, so design for manufacturing and assembly, which is one type of manufacturing, uh, one type of production and design for Six Sigma, there are two different approaches often used to reduce time, money and waste. Can you discuss the level at which these need to be incorporated into your design planning, at, you know, either at this phase or initially? Sure. Um, let me just begin, since some of these terms may be new to your listeners, with just a brief um, definition. DFMA, Design for Manufacturing and Assembly, it's a construct that asks the design engineers to consider 
essentially how the product can be manufactured and assembled in an efficient manner to reduce errors and effort in the manufacturing and assembly of that product. Um, whereas Design for Six Sigma refers to a suite of tools, in fact, um, that help design engineers structure their approach to product design in an efficient and thorough way. So maybe by example, I can express this more clearly. Um, some of this, the Design for Six Sigma tools include design of experiments, uh, such as the Taguchi fractional factorial method, Pokayoke, Demaic, D-M-A-I-C, uh, Kaizen, and, and there are many others. So Design for Six Sigma with regard to the timing and the level at which they should be incorporated, into the planning, as you asked me, I would say that design for Six Sigma tools can be used from the very beginning. Um, we use them to evaluate characteristics, for example, of different materials, which is one of the first things we look at in a design, the materials of, of construction, right? Right, so right. So it's uh, Taguchi fractional factorial, um, one of the design of experiment techniques, is an excellent way to compare materials of construction, iterations in product design, for example. Um, and also it can be used later in production development, process development too. Um, so I would say you would implement that first. Now, design for manufacturing, manufacturability and assembly, that should definitely be implemented prior to design freeze when we settle on our final product, um, you know, materials of construction and design, right. such that the final product can be easily and consistently assembled. Consistently is key here. It, um, right, but we we probably won't want to dive into DFMA until we know for sure what the final design looks like. That makes total sense, definitely. Okay, so that's going to come definitely towards the end of your product development, right? Closer to the end, I I would say after design freeze. But I must just I put one caveat in there for my fellow my manufacturing engineering friends who I know I can hear them sighing and yelling. That's over the airwaves right now. They're saying, no, start it earlier because the folks in manufacturing have to suffer uh, from poor design or design that doesn't consider manufacturability. And I'm sure they would say start it as soon as possible. And, and I would agree as long as we're not looking at every possible design iteration at that point, because that would be wasteful. Right. Of course. And can, can, are there, I, I imagine there are teams of people so that there can be someone sort of in the background saying, hey, don't forget to think about <laughs> as that you make it true. true, right? So you don't have all of this kind of um, thrown at you at the at the very end. You Absolutely. Know? Um, and, and as we are talking about this whole design and development phase, there's just so many factors to consider. Um, that must be well thought out and incorporated into the design. Can you highlight some typical challenges that you've seen when planning for packaging, labeling, product delivery, all the things that need to be considered now, even though we're not quite ready to launch the product, we still need to start thinking about all of these things. Oh my gosh. There are so, <laughs> there are so many I can think of where to begin. Um, Yes. So just a couple of, of high level comments here. Let's start with labeling. Labeling is not just a technical concern. It is also one of the very most important regulatory concerns. Um, in fact, you know, if a product is mislabeled, FDA considers it to be misbranded and misbranding can be a, a reason for recall and of course for other enforcement actions. It's very, very serious. So labeling, right? Labeling is one of the most, um, it's a very large challenge, um, even in a technical sense from a, sense from a product development perspective, because labeling will include very scientifically based elements like, I mean, most people think of the cool logo and maybe the size and the font and the point the size. The marketing type, marketing type right. element, not the technical, right? Right. You know, that label also includes the expiration date of the product, which is not something that we can come up with from a business perspective. Uh, it, they may have an input into what the customer will expect for, right. from a shelf life perspective, but it is a hard one and, and, and quite complex undertaking. So I also like to point out that for those listeners who may not have heard 
there is a new challenge in labeling um, UDI, Unique Device Identification. It's been implemented worldwide, and the intent is to enable, long-term to enable patients to be able to gather data information in a large, from a large database um, on, on the, say, the, the types of complaints or harms that have occurred with these devices. And short term or immediate term is to allow for better traceability, both in hospitals and in manufacturing facilities of our devices. So you Okay, so you need yeah. to device. So they know exactly where their particular device came from as a, you know, mm -hmm. in the lot or in the batch, right? Exactly Correct. which one. Yes. Hmm. That's right. Um, as we move quickly on to packaging, um, you know, packaging. So there is one of the smartest product development engineers I ever met um, out of Tufts University said that packaging Anytime there's a problem with a with a product, a medical device, it's she says it always comes back to packaging. One of the least planned for, uh, most minimized elements of design. You know, the design engineers who are focused on the product often don't even consider packaging until late phases, and then it's an afterthought. But in fact, particularly if we have a sterile barrier requirement for our packaging, packaging oh, right. is right. Packaging is responsible for protecting the product from our factory to the point at which it's used anywhere in the world where it's intended to be used. And then at the end of its shelf life, worst case, it may be pulled off a shelf after three years or five years or whatever the labeled shelf life will, will allow and must still be robust. Um, so packaging cannot be undervalued. Um, it's a huge a huge area. And in fact, many of our um, universities in the United States, at least, are actually providing graduate degrees in packaging design now. Wow. So, I mean, that's something that's very um, critical, I guess, to this whole design development process is really thinking through the packaging. I don't want to say as much as, but in in line with the development of the product, the actual product. Or even as much as in some cases, when, when it's a <laughs> sterile barrier, at least it's huge. And, and if you sure. think about the shipping and, you know, just uh, logistics involved and do we have to maintain a certain temperature right. uh, or a certain humidity? Yes. I mean, right. it's just, uh, it's, it's, it's a big issue. And we can link in those show notes. I know that you're planning to do so to some of the standards that will help your listeners, such as the ISTA 2A or the ASTM 4169D, to help uh, engineers Absolutely. plan for shipping so robots. Helpful. Yeah, thank you, Roberta. That would be so sure. helpful. My pleasure. So to move a little bit off of the um, packaging, labeling, product delivery, I mean, obviously that is um, critical to think about in the whole design and development. Um, but we're also, I want to move a little bit into the validation and verification mm -hmm. phase. Sure. Um, and there is a difference between validation and verification, um, lovingly referred to as V and V, right? Yeah. When right. is the best time to consider V and V in your product development cycle? Okay. So may I begin again with just a brief definition of the differences because again they're often these terms are often conflated and I think we need clarity to start. Please do. Yeah, I think that sometimes people think they're one and the same and really they're two uh very different um items. So if you can just outline each and then we can talk a little bit about why and when. Uh thanks. I uh, thank you Stacy. Yes, uh these are often misunderstood. So strictly in the design realm because these terms have different meanings in the in the manufacturing or process realm. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to limit these definitions to design verification and validation. Process okay. verification and validation have unfortunately entirely different meanings. So just a disclaimer. So design verification essentially uh, involves testing, uh, provisioning uh, uh, objective evidence through okay. testing and research to demonstrate that the product that we have conceptualized, created, 
meets its specification, the product spec. So if you're supposed to have a certain Rockwell hardness on a particular component, we would test that uh, as per the uh, appropriate test method that's been validated, ensuring that in fact it meets that specification for that Rockwell hardness. But now that doesn't tell us anything about whether it performs clinically, does it? Right. Right. That's where design validation comes in. So design validation doesn't look at the product spec. It looks at whether the product we've designed meets the user needs for its intended use in a, in a clinical setting or in the hands of that healthcare provider. Uh, so design verification precede, precedes design validation. We have to first meet our specification and then and only then would we attempt to show uh, clinical efficacy. So okay. that, I hope that clears up the terminology a bit. Now, with regard to when is the best time to consider them, well, we know, we know right off the bat in the beginning of our product development process that we're going to need to plan, as we discussed in the previous week's episode, for both verification and validation. The question, the if we, all, we always need to consider verification and validation, and rarely, if ever, can we omit either of them. What right. differs with V and V is the extent to which or the scope of the validation, most likely design validation. So design verification, we must always show that we made our specification. Design validation can be performed though in, in, in different ways with huge magnitude of difference among them. For example, we can make a case uh, if appropriate that Benchtop testing in a way that simulates an anatomical use or a clinical use may be acceptable for design validation uh, or animal studies, um, okay. the least of which human studies. That would be like the, the most um, robust or burdens and burdensome. But if we choose to not perform human testing as design part of design validation, we just need to document with a an engineering rationale, a justification for why we can adequately simulate a clinical or anatomical condition on the bench or in an animal. Do you find that that happens? I mean, is that, is that typical, I guess, that you would um, do bench testing as opposed to um, live clinical testing with, uh, with patients? Absolutely. Um, we always perform, I would say almost always, perform bench testing no matter what. The question is whether that's the end of it or do we right. need to move forward and then include animal or human testing. And of course, um, we, we, perf we make this decision with the timeliness and the cost uh, of the product involved, particularly if we are answering to um, our venture capitalists, if there are partners uh, or you know our stockholders. But in particular, I've seen a real um, awareness and evolution over the 30 years that I've been doing this work w with regard to concern for the welfare of animals and, of course, for humans. So it's not just about being costly. It's about being humane and ethical and responsible and appropriate. Right. No, and that's exactly the thought that was running through my head because, uh, you know, it can, there is a risk involved anytime you are doing clinical trials on humans and or animals. Um, so you want to be sure, I can imagine in the first phases of this development that you're pretty certain of the outcomes um, yes. for uses of the device. So so thank you for clarifying that even more. Um, My pleasure. Yeah, of course. So I just want to reach back a little bit, you know, in the design and not in the design, excuse me, in the planning phase, we talked about uh, risk management. And um, I know that risk management is something that we're going to consider throughout the development life cycle. Mm -hmm. um, building and evaluating your risk management file ultimately helps identify the likelihood and severity of risks and reduce or mitigate product failure. So a little bit, you've, you've mentioned each of those a little bit as we've moved along here. Can you discuss how managing compliance through evaluation of the risk management cycle helps ensure quality and safety are built into the product? Oh, absolutely. And, and it really, it really does. You know, as a practitioner of risk management, 
in design engineering, I can say firsthand, um, there are, through this systematic process of risk management, there are many instances of potential harm that have been thwarted because we followed a systematic process and didn't just rely on our intuition or our memories. So really, the risk management process um, at its core provides a systematic means of applying experience, insight, judgment, and objective evidence um, to identify and then to mitigate the, the risks associated with the use of medical devices. And to break it into its simplest terms, it requires us to take a look at two things. First, the probability of the occurrence of harm, because it won't always occur. So the, the likelihood, the probability of the occurrence. And then assuming it does occur, what are the consequences of that harm? And not just to patients like we used to think, but we're really evaluating the consequences of harm to uh, stakeholders across the entire product life cycle. So we're talking here about patients, physicians, data, property, other medical equipment that may be attached or used concomitantly with our device. Um, and, and of course, also the environment. Of course. <laughs> So, um, so that's something that you're planning for from the very beginning, and it, yes. you know, follow, following through, um, all in the attempts to have the safest products of, you know, and also, I would imagine to um, save time later retesting and having to go backwards and look at things that you, you know, either weren't documented well or you didn't have as part of your risk management plan. So. A um, couple of follow-up questions, if I may, to things we spoke about just a moment ago. Sure. Um, one was the uh, product labeling. So you mentioned that there's been significant changes in labeling requirements uh, recently. And mm -hmm. I, in follow-up, how does one go about determining the expiry date? Because I'm... I, I had this thought after we started speaking uh, speaking um, on the next topic, and I thought, you know, for devices, I think in pharmaceuticals, people understand there's an expiration date because chemicals mm -hmm. degrade, et cetera. But in devices, I'm not sure that people necessarily think of an expiry date. So can you talk a little bit about that and how you go about um, figuring out what expiry date is to be placed on any given label? Uh, sure. And I, I agree. I, you know, I never thought of it quite the way that way until you said so, Stacey. But of course, it makes much more sense when we're talking pharmaceuticals than it does when we're thinking about polymers and, you know, tangible devices that we hold in our hands. How, how do those have chemistry involved? Right. Yes. But indeed, they do. So that's a very, it's a very good point you make. Well, and it turns out, that it's really not so different from the chemical considerations. In fact, we, when we're looking at medical devices, for example, disposable medical devices, which are largely constructed of polymers, we're using the same Arrhenius curve uh, with regard to chemical reaction rates to make determinations about the degradation over time and with temperature and so on of polymers as are used in, in the pharmaceutical industry with, say, APIs, active pharmaceutical ingredients. So essentially, we apply the Arrhenius curve, um, given a particular reaction rate for the polymers of major construction, and we, we use the Arrhenius equation, which relates reaction rates and heat to time to shorten the, the time required for us to essentially predict to predict fairly well, fairly accurately, robustly, how this polymer, for example, may degrade with time. So if we are looking for, say, a three-year shelf life, we generally list it in months, so a 36-month shelf life. By the right. way, in Japan, we'd have to make it 37 months of testing in order to label it for 36 months, as I was alluding to oh, last week. So wow. you can see, once you've invested 36 months in, in doing this study, 
for want of 30 days, you'd have to repeat the entire study to get the Japanese uh, documentation together. So just a footnote. Yeah, no, very, very good to note that. Thank you, Roberta. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, so yeah, that's a mistake people make generally one time and one time only. So um, <laughs> using, using the Arrhenius curve for reaction rates will perform accelerated aging on our product and our requirement, and, and we can in fact release product, um, assuming that everything meets its specification and requirements thereafter. We can release product with a shelf life labeled based just on the accelerated aging using Arrhenius curve. However, there's one requirement we must simultaneously conduct real-time aging. So we can reduce that 36 month uh, timeline down to a you know, very short timeline, depending on the heat tolerance of our polymers, you know, maybe to a handful of weeks, maybe three months. It just depends on the heat tolerance that equation defines for us. But we must simultaneously be conducting real-time ambient temperature condition, humidity condition, shelf life testing with the product for three years and then we must test it as well and if it for any reason fails to meet the specification after three years of real-time aging we might we are required wow. to so, take an action roberta beginning in 2006 and continuing today there's an emphasis on test method validation during <laughs> product development can you talk yeah. about how test method validation fits into this phase and why it's so important? Yes. Oh, boy. You hit the nail on the head, Stacey. It, it has been a real paradigm shift since about 2006. Uh, many of my colleagues in the medical device industry were surprised by you know, what, in retrospect, makes perfect sense. But at the time, I don't think too many of us saw it coming. And that was the insurgence of a new series of questions, valid questions, no doubt, by the FDA in the U.S. around data. So we provide verification data. We provide validation data, right? And we, we're, we're looking at evidence all the time in building and testing our products. And when we do so, we're often relying on equipment, measuring equipment. Uh, to provide that data to us. And so the question came along, hmm, I see you have all this nice data and you performed appropriate statistical techniques to analyze the data, but let me ask you this, what is the resolution capability of this measuring equipment? And so let's say that you're trying to discern the difference between two products um, one that would be considered compliant and one that would be considered defective. Maybe they differ by um, a dimensional length measurement of, say, I don't know, two millimeters. But we're using mm -hmm. a ruler that is marked off in inches <laughs> or even in centimeters, but inches even worse. So right. to, to what degree does the resolu resolution of that tool allow us to discern compliant from non-compliant product, defective from non-defective product. It doesn't. So right. this is just a very, very simple example of what is pervasive. We use much, much more complicated metrics and equipment measurements in many cases and software that is associated. And so we need to look at really the accuracy of of that piece of equipment, the precision, precision having to do with essentially standard deviation, accuracy having to do with how close it is to the true value of the measurement of the part. Um, you know, is it an appropriate product or technique rather for that product? And in many cases, once these questions were asked, the answer was no. And so many, many hundreds of millions, even billions of dollars have been spent since that time validating or proving and in many cases changing the measurement equipment and techniques so that we know now much more so than we ever knew before that when we say a product is compliant, that in fact it is. And we can really tell the difference. And I think the consumers um, benefit from this largely. It just it, it makes a much higher quality product with a lot less 
um, errors, I would think. And it's also so, so, so important when, as you move into the actual manufacturer of mm -hmm. the device that yeah. you can be, that you're as accurate as possible, I would think. By all means, we need to know that the design we've selected for manufacturing actually works the way we think it does and that it's not just an error in our equipment. Right. I mean, because you're trying to reproduce these over and over and over again. So yeah. even the slightest, slightest miscalculation, I would think, um, is going to, you know, cause major issues in production. Well, you know, it depends you know, to, to your to your point, um, it, the, the degree of of error sometimes it can be fairly large, it, but it has to be appropriate to what we're trying to show. And in many cases, um, it's okay to have more error. It, it just has to be a, a considered and thoughtful decision. Okay. And one that you've accounted for, right? Absolutely. Development, of course. Yes. Well, Roberta, we have covered a lot in this um, in this second episode, uh, design, yeah. design and development. Um, before, um, before we wrap up, what final thoughts come to mind? Hmm. Well, I guess going back to the beginning of, of the episode today, um, I'm thinking that it's so important and reflecting on my experience in this industry, so important to engage all appropriate stakeholders as early in the design and development process as possible. Um, you know, having the manufacturing representative be present at the design meetings so that we can have uh, a design that is in fact manufacturable, um, looking at opportunities to leverage existing regulatory filings or submissions that, um, you know, by having a regulatory affairs person sit in, um, a chemist who maybe can help with some of the accelerated aging parameters with regard to what temperature our polymers that we're considering could withstand so that we can accurately judge how long this will take to accomplish these these are things that we never we never regret. Absolutely, thank you so much. I, I think it's always best if you can have all of the experts in the same room at the same time uh, before you make some key decisions. Right? It just makes everybody's life easier um, because you've thought of all of the different sides uh, prior to leaping in. So, great advice for our listeners as we. Uh, end this second episode. I thank you so much. Thank you again to our guest, Roberta Good. Thank you for having me. Of course, it's our pleasure. Thank you again to uh, our producer, Ed Sullivan, and Studio 21 Podcast Cafe. To our listeners, if you enjoyed this episode, please don't forget to subscribe in your podcast player of choice. And also, share with your friends and colleagues. That's how they know we exist, and we appreciate it when you do. You can find out more about Voices and Validation podcasts as well as the IVT Network by visiting ivtnetwork.com. And we invite you to join us next week for another great episode when we conclude this three-part series on taking your medical device to market. So until then... Have a great week and we'll see you next time. The views and opinions expressed by the hosts, guests, or callers of this program do not necessarily reflect the opinions of the Studio 21 Podcast Cafe, the United Podcast.